My name is Sami, and I'm a designer. So, and I'm here to talk about uh, why design matters. Why design matters to any company, any product nowadays. And I do what I do because I want to shape the world for the better. I want to do things that are meaningful. I want to do things that actually change and affect people's lives. And I believe that this is the way any company, any product should work nowadays. Design should be somehow embedded in the DNA in every single decision of every company. Uh, I work at a company called Nordcap. We're a design consultancy, and I co-founded the company with a couple of other guys in 2007. And we've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of clients who share our passion of doing things that actually affect people's lives. We work with uh, some of the biggest corporations around, as well as a lot of startups. So I thought actually showing the usual logo slide here would be really boring. So here's actually some of our startup clients. So give a round of applause for them. And the common uh, combining factor is that they all do something they believe in. And this is where design comes into play. Because like Marco talked before and Kari mentioned, uh, design is something much, much more deeper than just the surface. It's not the new shiny thing, it's not the UI, but it's the whole system, how it works, how it feels like. And most of all, design is actually very good at finding clarity, finding direction to actually base your decisions later on. And uh, yeah, design is also a lot about saying no instead of saying yes. And here's the catch. Good design actually is hard. It's really hard. It's really easy to do the basic stuff. Uh, there are a lot of frameworks out there, uh, web typography, all that kind of stuff is evolving. But doing the actual really, really good design takes time, money, and faith. And also one very important thing there is mutual transparency. So whenever we work with designers, you have to be honest. You have to trust them as well, because they'll pay you off. And in architecture and everywhere, good design is sort of like it's more than some of its parts. So when you combine design technology with people, you're actually getting very close to something that has the makings of being magical. Magic is a uh, word shown around a lot of these days, but magic is also pretty hard. And design helps you to achieve that, because design is the intellectual craft that actually finds out what people need and enables you to actually find and deliver answers to the hard questions. And architects like Eero Saarinen have talked for a long, long time about designing things for the next larger context. So when you design a chair, you have to consider the room it's, it's going to sit in. When you design an apartment, you have to consider the building, uh, the city master plan, and so forth. And I think this applies to digital products as well. So when you design a UI, you have to consider the behaviors, how it flows, what it feels like, who's going to use it and where, what's the context, things like that. And this is really important because no product is an island. Entropy is a natural state in the universe, and change will always happen. And change will be unpredictable as well. So uh, change leads to paradigm shifts. And uh, paradigm shift leads to very quick changes on people's perception on what is actually a good product, what is good design. So things like this can actually change basically overnight. What happened to Nokia N95 when the iPhone came out? I know this because I worked at Nokia Design back then. And uh, Spade came out of nowhere and changed a lot of things, how people perceive good products. And the thing with design is that uh, a lot of the startup culture is based on metrics, right? So you have to measure things, uh, you have to make things better by measuring different kinds of things. So 
Design is pretty hard to measure in that sense, because a lot of the stuff uh, kind of taps into subconscious. Things like intuition, feelings, things like that. So the measurements and the return of investment on design, it's quite long-term, it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. So there's much, much more to that. And uh, the way our lizard brain reacts to the best design, it makes it seem really effortless and easy. And what actually makes uh, products seem great is the attention to details. So in the current world, there's more and more noise. So you have to be, perceive yourself as clearer. You have to be consistent and coherent in your messaging. That's the only way you're going to stand out in a crowd, in a competition. And people talk about a lot about intuitive views and stuff like that. So it's easy to uh, realize that being intuitive is actually being familiar. You have to have some kind of cues, affordances to people so they know how to use your new shiny thing from the based on their previous experiences. And things that are not really measurable, this is a uh, screenshot from Class of the Clowns. If you look at the cute little pig right over there on the barbecue in the camp, it has no place whatsoever in the actual sheet. Its value cannot be measured, but it's still very valuable to the whole coherent gameplay experience. It makes the thing detailed, it makes it fun. And Karri talked about designless startups already. That's one common denominator as well. If you look at things like Path, there's like this insane attention to detail on the craft, how things look like, how they work like. So whatever you choose to do, do it as well as you can. Uh, this is one of our clients' Finnish startup. It's called Readberry. And their goal is to make the best social reading experience in the world. So this works in a browser. So we actually had to do the responsive typography tailored to all different kinds of screens, PPIs and stuff like that. And we did this because we wanted to be the best reading experience in the world. And I think we are getting pretty close there. It is quite nice. Check it out when, they, when it comes out. As much as it's about typography, static points, stuff like that, you have to look at the space in between. So the empty spaces, transitions, stuff, stuff like that, they make a major part of the feeling, how things feel like. So what's the narrative of a product? What does going from A to B to Z actually feel like? And I, it's really hard to actually talk about good design without mentioning Apple or Jonathan Ivey nowadays. So, I'm going to frame this thing Karri said about product personality. So, a lot of designers, they project themselves into the work they do. So, things we do define us who we are in a way. And this is important in a way that you really don't want to be that guy. Sort of like, if your product looks like a blog template, you need to try harder. If you still playing on really plain typography, Helvetic and stuff like that, you really need to try harder. Because there's no excuse to not to do so. Everyone else around you is going to do so. And learn to focus on what matters, basically. I mean, paper app, they basically reinvented how uh, color works when they spent six months working on the color picker of theirs. So instead of uh, doing minimum viable products, you actually should do best viable product. So and this happens only by including design from the day one, including skilled designers in your team. If you have none, talk to consultants, people around you, they will help you. We're not evil people. We want good for our clients as well. And the thing is, like, you have to be in the long run, because the thing you may do today, may as well become the standard of the tomorrow. Jared Lanier calls this thing karma vertigo, and I think this is a really, really good base to get, actually get started in from. Meaning from, uh, you have to build sustainable relationship with the community, with your team, uh, with other companies, designers, etc., etc. 
And you, have, you should invest in design because it will pay off. And I want to end with this quote from uh, the godfather of sci-fi, Arthur C. Clarke. So the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them to the impossible. And he also stated that uh, if things seem impossible, you are probably getting too old. So think about that. Thank you very much.